Yeah, this is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from a rather cold Johannesburg here in South Africa. My name, of course, Evan Janssen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios here in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube right now with the entire show available on our YouTube channel all of the time, really. Now, recent studies show untreated mental illness at alarming levels here in South Africa. We'll look at that a little bit later. First, we'll wrap proceedings in the Oscar Pistorius trial with Griselda Lewis, who's here with us. And then we look back at last night's amazing World Cup semi-final results. First, though, Anin gives us the headlines. Good morning, I'm Anin Dormal. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. The National Union of Metal Workers has announced that it will hold a special National Executive Committee meeting to give feedback on the outcome of its latest negotiation with employers. The union says a new offer was tabled during negotiations yesterday, but was unable to give details of the offer. The committee meeting is expected to take place later today. The National Commissioner of Police, Ria Pieja, has in the meantime said that the strike, which has been characterized by violence and intimidation, is being closely monitored by the police. Political analysts say the re resignation of a Hang SA leader, Dr. Mampela Rampili, is an indication that small opposition parties in South Africa are disappearing in obscurity. Rampili, who launched her party last year, has decided to quit politics after just a year in the political arena. She established a Hang SA amid some fanfare promising to restore South Africa of Nelson Mandela. The cause of a metro rail train accident that left 80 people injured is being investigated. Two passenger trains collided near Berea and Durban last night, where passengers sustained minor to moderate injuries. One of the trains was on its way from Umlazi to Berea station when the accident occurred. The world's youngest nation, South Sudan, celebrates its independence from Sudan today. The festive scenes that captured the historic nature of Juba's long struggle for independence from Khartoum was likely to be a distant memory. The country is involved in a seven-month civil war between the governments of President Saul Bakir and rebel breakaway from the SPLM under former Vice President Luke Makar. Last night, Brazil's hope of winning their sixth World Cup was shattered by Germany, who scored five goals in 18 astonishing first half minutes on their way to a 7-1 semi-final. Germany will now meet Argentina or the Netherlands in Sunday's final in Rio de Janeiro. That's all from me. Back to you, Yevon. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Anine. It was an amazing, an amazing result. But we'll talk about the details of that a little bit later. Of course, closing arguments in the Oscar Pistorius murder trial have been set aside for August 7th and 8th. This will be a final attempt for the state and defense to convince the North Gauteng High Court of their respective cases. The Paralympians defense team uh, closed its case yesterday. Now, there for that moment was, of course, our reporter, Criselda Lewis, uh, who's been covering the trial for the last... Uh, uh, for the last four months. Is it four months now, five months? Into five months, yeah. But Into five months. That's it's, right. Well, it feels like yesterday that we were on the pavement there for the first time. But just on yesterday, were you surprised a little bit at the way that proceedings sort of came to an end at just 15, less than 15 minutes in the morning? Sort of an abrupt end to proceedings, weren't it? Well, uh, not surprised at all, Yevon, because uh, defence advocate Barry Rue had indicated last week already that he planned uh, to wrap up his case, but uh, certainly tried to, to get uh, some last-minute uh, uh, assistance there when we saw that he tried uh, to uh, get uh, uh, some consultation with the state psychiatrist who was part of the evaluation team uh, that uh, basically assessed Oscar Pistorius over those 30 days. But uh, Judge Tawazila Masipa saying that it would not have been in the interest of justice for the defense to consult with the state psychiatrist. So a last minute uh, uh, dealt a blow there, but certainly not surprised because there had been that indication last week already. Would you call it frustration or, or maybe fatigue that uh, Barry Rue sort of said towards the end of it that uh, 
they closed because some witnesses didn't want to come forward and testify. Look, Evan, most of the experts that we've spoken to have indicated two things. Number one, you've got to remember that the Oscar Pistorius trial is the first trial in South Africa to be beamed around the world. Yeah. I mean, the interest in this case has been absolutely phenomenal. We haven't seen uh, something like this in South Africa in the justice system ever. So you would get uh, some of the witnesses, for example, getting cold feet, not mm. wanting their voices, as he indicated, to be uh, beamed throughout the world. You'll remember that they did have the choice not to have their faces broadcast, but already in terms of the voices, they did not want that to happen. But of course, the, the court could have subpoenaed them. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Barry Roo saying that uh, that did not happen, they absolutely declined, uh, basically indicating, which might work to, to, to the advantage at a later stage, in indicating if they wanted to appeal for example, that there were people who uh, did not come forward who could have uh, perhaps assisted their case. Now, you were at the coalface right there on that pavement throughout the entire trial. Just give us your sort of views on it and, and how this trial sort of changed over the, over the four or five months that it's, uh, that it's been. It was bound to be a very interesting trial from the beginning, uh, Eben, given the stature of the person that we're talking about, Oscar Pistorius, of course, going on to defy the odds and putting South Africa on the map. So, you know, in the beginning when we started uh, seeing uh, allegations of police bungling, number one, that took centre stage in the very beginning, you know, really questioned, you know, how police, for example, handle crime scene evidence. And it then went to a stage where... The real matters relating to the case started unpacking when we saw Oscar Pistorius take the stand and the strong man went on to defy the odds that we all knew uh, was yeah. very different in the dock, breaking down and uh, uh, vomiting and not able to, to relay the events of what he says happened on the morning that he shot and killed Reva Stienkamp. Then there were the graphic, graphic images that... Mm had everybody in the gallery really at a chill. And very important for us was to monitor the reactions of both the families, the Steenkamps and the Pistoriuses. Yeah. The Pistoriuses have been, been there from the very beginning, showing Oscar Pistorius support. And, of course, there's uh, Reva Steenkamp's mother, on the other hand, who's remained stony-faced from the very beginning. Yeah. Absolutely no reaction. Yeah. And she's not granted any interviews to South African media. So to really get that one-on-one uh, -on -one sense of really how she is doing is, is, is something that really remains to be seen. But what we can gauge from where we were sitting was that certainly she was a woman who was very distraught, as any mother would be in, under those circumstances. But not much that we can gauge from what she's feeling. I want to talk to you about the performance of the council in this case. Uh, and what would you put the score at if it was a football match between Harry Nell and Barry Roo? Okay, this is not a football <laughs> match, yeah, but this is not Brazil versus, versus Germany. But, you know, certainly, you know, the, the conversations that we're really being having outside court is that, you know, every time when you speak of uh, state institutions and their performance, there's, there's always a sort of uh, um, uh, sense that, you know, state institutions don't do their jobs. There's no confidence in, in the South African yeah. justice system. But when you looked at Gheri Nell perform on the stand, certainly this is not the first time that, that I have seen him in a case yeah. before. But for everybody else, was like, is this how state prosecutors can behave on the stand? Is this what really happens? Yeah. That is what we were gauging from the many people we were communicating with on, on the streets, on social networking sites. Then, of course, there was the defense. I mean, it's certainly the defense's job to keep Oscar Pistorius out of jail and of yeah. course that as they've been maintaining that what he did was an absolute mistake so for them to defend Oscar Pistorius that's it's normal but the way that it all unfolded in spectacular uh, uh, circumstances in front of the public eye uh, beamed throughout the world certainly was something uh, uh, to, to marvel at but of course yeah. not marvel in the sense that uh, of course we're not forgetting that somebody was shot and killed in this instance absolutely yeah. it, it, that's at the heart of the matter is that somebody yeah. lost their life finally I want to ask you about the media and how the coverage sort of changes but also where do the media put the state of the case uh, right now uh, are we looking at uh, uh, going into extra time or, or is Oscar a little bit behind the game, as it were? Well, it doesn't look like we'll go into extra time, uh, if I may. Yeah. Uh, look, at the moment, uh, we'll go back in August uh, the 7th and the 8th. Those two days have been set aside for closing arguments. And really, we'll get a sense there, uh, finally, as you pointed out, that you, exactly what the state and the defence are saying, the final uh, 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 stage to try and convince the North Harting High Court of their, of their respective cases. But, you know, um, it's... 
sealed at this point. Whatever decision that the judge may come to, those closing arguments will happen. Yeah. Then we'll take that postponement. She'll go and make her decision. And then what happens after that will remain to be seen. But certainly we'll get an indication during closing arguments, uh, you know, uh, where the defense uh, might want to take this, uh, whatever the outcome of uh, the Oscar Pistorius trial is at the end of the day. But certainly I think uh, the court has used up its time uh, quite sufficiently. Yes, we are well into extra time in this matter, but thank you. And I wanted to tell you, you did a fantastic job the entire time uh, that we, we crossed you almost every morning when the trial was on. And we were always on point and always had the right guests and the right point of view. Thank always you. Always so kind, Evan. Thank, thank you. you very much. Crisalda Lewis, of course, some in the studio call her uh, Miss Pretorius, Pistorius at the moment because of her direct link with the trial. She says that this one will definitely go to penalties by the looks of it and will get a result hopefully before the end of August after final arguments on the 7th and 8th of August. Just to recap, the Oscar Pistorius murder trial will resume on the 7th for closing arguments. Pistorius has pleaded not guilty to four charges, including the murder of his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, on Valentine's Day last year. The state called 19 witnesses before the court. Defense advocate Barry Rue told the court yesterday that they could have called well, more than 16 wit more witnesses in the athlete's defense who argued that they faced challenges with witnesses who refused to testify because of the global media coverage. Track star Oscar Pistorius is a lot closer to knowing his fate. We closed the case for the defense. After 16 defense witnesses, Pistorius's lawyers portrayed the Paralympian as a man in love and a victim of crime. The states painted him as a short-tempered gun lover who killed Riva Steenkamp in a fit of rage. Pistorius pleaded not guilty to murder, claiming he pulled the trigger because he thought there was an intruder in his home. Law experts say many challenges had hit a brick wall. In order to secure a conviction, the state must uh, succeed during cross-examination uh, in basically three things. To show there are contradictions in the version of the other party, that the version is inconsistent, and that, those, that the witness that testifies uh, that his demeanor and uh, his, 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 his evidence is so unreliable that it could easily, easily be disregarded as ultimately a lie. So that is the only requirement that must be shown by the, uh, by the state, and I think they have done a reasonably good job in order to secure precisely that. In August, counsel will have two days for closing arguments. Judge Togozile Masipa issued an order prohibiting publication of the argument documents before they're presented in court. It's very concerning what you've just said, but I know it has happened in the past. Yes, ma'am. That people, it's theft, in fact. People leak out documents which are not supposed to be leaked out. Indeed, ma'am. And whoever uses it is not only, you know, doing a disservice. To, um, to justice, but he's also a thief. The case dubbed the O.J. Simpson trial of South Africa hogged local and international headlines with a series of eyebrow-raising moments, including a 30-day mental evaluation of the athlete and leaked footage showing Pistorius reenacting the events that led to the murder. But Judge Masipa will have the final say on the extent of criminal responsibility. Leaving the courthouse, Oscar Pistorius was shielded by his older brother, Carl, from hordes of journalists. If found guilty of murder, he could face up to 25 years in prison and an abrupt end to his glittering sports career. Chris Alda Lewis, SABC News, at the North Gauteng High Court. Last week, the Gauteng Provincial Parliament caused a stir by forcefully removing 10 members of the Economic Freedom Fighters from the legislature for their well, inappropriate attire. Since after the May election, EFF members have been noticeable with their trademark red overalls and domestic aprons. But Gauteng is the only legislature that have acted against the EFF attire. The National Assembly, together with eight other provincial legislatures, have allowed the uniforms in their chambers. Our ANC's chief whip in the Gauteng legislature, Mr. Brian Flongwa, joins us in studio to give us clarity on the steps that they've embarked on. Firstly, good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning and thank you for having me. I think the first question is why is Gauteng the only legislature 
that would not budge on these famous now red uniforms? Well, firstly, we are a constitutional democracy, a multi-party democracy. And in terms of the constitution, each legislature is allowed to set its own business processes, including its rules. In our case, we have standing orders, which includes the code of conduct and a dress code. Now, any member can propose that either the rules be amended, revoked, or added on. But there's a process of doing that. There's a rules committee, which is multi-party. So if the EFF would want the rules to be reviewed, they must submit a proposal. But we just can't make a unilateral decision that we're going to break the existing rules. What about the fact that they allowed in other legislatures and in the National Assembly, but you're taking what by some are now seen as a very hard line on this party? Well, it's not a hard line, really. These are the rules as they exist. And the rules basically call for appropriate attire. Appropriate could be formal or traditional. Now, me and you would know, you must have a sense of occasion. If you go to a funeral, you don't dress like you're going to a picnic. If I invite you to my house, it's either I say dress smart casual, formal, or traditional. Similarly, every institution, the courts, judges wear robes. That's the code of conduct. So in our case, we're not hard and fast on this. All that we're saying is that the EFF, as a newly registered party, who have made an oath to observe all the rules and the constitution of this country, will have to follow procedure. Otherwise, there'd be chaos. What will happen next time? Can we rock up in the house? dressed in pyjamas, shorts, sandals, jeans, sneakers. I, I understand completely where you're coming from, but is this petty fight not interfering with the work that you're supposed to be doing as the legislature? I agree fully. There are many pressing issues that are facing this country. We have problems of unemployment, health, social development, etc. I think in this case, the FF has painted itself into a corner because the approach to our legislative system is that they'll defy, they'll just break laws and that's how they hope change will happen. But, but We're not going to allow it. But why, in a way, you're playing into their hands because what you're doing now is giving the, this issue the media coverage and the attention that you would want to avoid, one would think. Well, look, it is the Speaker of the House who's entrusted with the responsibility of enforcing the rules. Now, the rules are there to be enforced and that's why I have the rules in the first place. Now, you talk about appropriate attire, and it's yes. not appropriate attire, and, and that you, they'll be forcefully removed, of course, if they're not dressed properly for the legislature. Are you now going to furnish him with a prescription or a description? What is, uh, what, what is this attire, uh, as they pointed out they would want to hear from you? Well, before we're all sworn in as public representatives, we're taken through a comprehensive process of induction to say this is how the legislature functions, these are the standing rules, this is what dressing appropriately means, and the FF have been part of that. And in fact, if you recall, during the official opening of the legislature, they were there, they were dressed like everybody else normal. So this is just a gimmick, it's a ploy, just to hawk newspaper headlines. But, but, but by kicking them out and taking this hard line, you're playing, you playing into their hands. It's clear to see that you are causing this to be an issue for a lot longer than it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be brushed aside and we should be getting on with the governance of the most important province in the country. Well, as the chief whip of the majority party, I've convened a meeting with all leaders of parties to say, look, there is a way in which this matter could be resolved. I had a discussion with advocate Dalim Pofu, yeah. who was representing the EFF, and I think he fairly understands the dilemma that is facing all of us. All that it takes, really, is for the EFF to say this is what we believe in, let's make a proposal to the Rules Committee, and ultimately to the resolution of the House, the matter must be brought to finality. Secondly, once the Speaker has made a ruling, and you defy that ruling, yeah. You undermine the system. Where is it going to end? You'd remember in the past there have been members who have refused to basically accept the rulings of the House. Yeah. Jack Bloom was a case in, in hand, if you remember. Yeah. He was banned for about 15 days. And before that, there were a number of other members. So the issue is there's a decorum that must be maintained of this institution. And once that decorum collapses, then the whole legislature would become a circus.
Don't you feel that you, you're losing a little bit of face in the public by taking this line when it's been allowed everywhere else? And, and in some cases, people talk about this kind of uh, the red overalls in Parliament and so forth as, as uh, childish behaviour in a way. It is. Uh, can you allow yourself then to be antagonised by this kind of childish behaviour? No, it's not the question of me as an individual. I've not made any rule. The rules have been there for the past 20 years. The issue is we have this novelty, the new kids in the block who are wearing gumboots, who are wearing overalls and hard hats. Now, we all know that is work where. Yes. Basically, all of this is about how miners are dressing. Now, yes. the legislature is not a mine. Now, I'm not averse to the idea of rules being reviewed, but there must be a process. Otherwise, it's anarchy. I indeed, very much agree, agreed with you. How do you see this scenario, though, finally play out in the next month or so? Well, I've made a suggestion. The next sitting of the House is on the 22nd of this month. And I must indicate also the whole of last week, the AFF members have been attending committees dressed appropriately. So it's not like they don't know what appropriate means. I was even saying to Advocate Mbofu, you know, he's appearing before the Falam Commission. Why doesn't he go there wearing overalls and gumboots? He knows it won't be an appropriate way of dressing. Yes. And it's obviously a way to, to antagonize, uh, antagonize and to stir a little bit, uh, yes. as it were. It's caused, it's caused uh, I believe, a lot of unnecessary uh, newspaper, newspaper column space and, and television space. But uh, uh, thank you for joining us in clearing up these issues for it's us today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. That's the ANC Chief, Chief Whip in the Gauteng Legislature, Mr. Brian Longa, joining us this morning to give us the views within the legislature as to why they're taking the stance against the EFF. Now, let's take a look at what you are talking about on social media. Of course, at the SABC Newsroom is where you can send us your contributions. Henny Krill, well, everyone's talking about the football. Oh, geez, seven more Brazilian fans are having worse depression than Ahang voters today, says Henny Krill. That's definitely right. Jerome September says, to think that my voting end lasted longer than Mampela Rampela did in politics. Still got mad love for her, though, says Jerome uh, September. RIP, rest in peace. I think that's a little bit premature. Bevan says, Mampela will not be taken serious even if she goes back to civil society. Akang is a destroyed their reputation in total. Sadly so. Tarun Tusi says, can Akang Essay be put on? No, Alex, have my hundred rand ready to buy it. Oh, the boot, the gloves are definitely off this morning. Um, it seems as if people are having a full go at Akang Essay and uh, their former leader now. Well, let's take a look at what's on the front pages of the World Papers from across the globe. Uh, looking at last night's World Cup semi-final, it was one of the most freaky results of all time where Brazil's hopes of advancing to the final got shattered by Germany, who scored five goals in just 18 first half minutes on their way to a 7-1 semi-final annihilation. Germany will now meet the winner of tonight's other semi-final between Argentina and the Netherlands. That match takes place, of course, at the Maracana tonight and it'll be broadcast on our sister channel now. A new controversial ad from Feed a Child South Africa is being described as racist and has South Africans up in arms. The advert, which has been removed from YouTube, shows a black child being fed by a white woman from a dinner table. Take a look at the video, which is still on the NGO's Facebook page, and you decide for yourself. Yeah, that is the ad that's causing a lot of consternation, consternation rather, on social media. What do you think of it? Send us your views to at SABC Newsroom. Uh, oh, that's on our Twitter page. And, of course, Facebook, pretty much the same, forward slash SABC Newsroom there. And leave us your comments. What do you think of that? Is it racist? Is it out of line? Is it out of order? You're watching Newsroom on SABC News.
UIF beneficiaries can now apply online for UIF benefits. Go to ufiling.gov.za or call 0800-843-843. No more queues. UIF working for you. SABC News, we've got Africa covered. United States President Barack Obama has expressed sadness over the shooting at a U.S. Army base in Fort Hood in Texas. A soldier opened fire on fellow service members at the military base, killing three people and wounding 16 others before committing suicide at the same post. Uh, I want to just assure all of us that uh, we are going to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. Um, you know, any shooting is troubling. Uh, obviously, this reopens the pain of what happened in Fort Hood uh, five years ago. We urge you to stay with us here on AM News on Channel 404 on DSTV with myself, Elvis Preslin. And me, Kendall Makhamati. We'll be back at the top of the hour, so do not touch that remote. That's AM News, daily at 10 a.m. on SABC News. Welcome back. This is Newsroom on SABC News. Now, last night we have one of the most amazing results in the history of World Cup football. Germany beat host Brazil by seven goals to one, and it could have been a lot worse. Now, this weekend the final is taking place, and we're going to take a look at some of the most talked about matches, incidents, and individuals. Of course, as always, the person who joins us to talk about that is Tonya Curi, who's the managing director of Roy South Africa. Good morning, Tonya. Thanks for joining us. Morning, Evan. Has anybody recovered from last night, by the way? Isn't it unbelievable? 7-1. Yes. I uh, mean, that is just ridiculous. We've seen jokes on social media this morning that uh, the Brazilian president has banned 7-Up from the country. <laughs> 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 oh. And I heard another good one. I heard that um, Argentina has Messi, Portugal has Ronaldo, and mm. Germany has a team. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a bit. Just run us through some of, the, well, some of these stats. These are preliminary stats as we go into the final week. Is yes, that right? that's right. So, so these stats, um, a lot of them on here are taken from the past 24 hours, and it's taken from media across the globe, social mm. media and online news. And um, what I've done is built you a, a graph there that, that looks at last night's match yeah. and um, the messages that came out of the out of the media Brazil as a team coming in at 29% Neymar they still everybody saying like Neymar is the reason 7-1 really no I Neymar's mean, really, not the guys, Neymar's no. not the reason I thought the person that they missed was maybe the captain in defense yes because they looked like schoolboys defending against a German team that just passed them off the park so if Neymar was there it might have been 7-2 yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so Neymar coming in 40% of the time. Scolari apologised to his nation for, um, for the poor performance of the team. So that came in at 21% of the time. I, I would also apologise if I'm at risk of having my house burnt down. I think, you know, Evan, they're very serious about yeah. uh, football in Brazil. I mean, uh, it's religion. It's a religion, yeah. You know, they call, I, I thought they were out of line before the start of last night's semi final when they spoke about they want to have the guy who who tackled Neymar, they want to have him shot and See. killed. You know, 20 years ago, we, we lost sure, Andres Escobar yes. from Colombia. He was shot. So I thought it was in very bad taste. And they got the hiding that they deserved last night because, you know, sometimes host nations can bubble a little bit over. I well, think. and I think the reaction after the game, and that's the graph you're having a look at on the right yeah. there, um, the reaction after the game resulted in protests, fighting, um, security threats, etc. There even talks of match fixing. Yeah, match fixing came up, um, that came up quite, for, uh, over the past week or so, match fixing has been yeah. sort of rumbling in the media. Um, FIFA investigating certain angles, um, the ticket scam arrest. You know, yeah, there's a the thing around the Cameron team that came out. The, the one bookie predicted this 4-0 score beforehand and, yes. and so forth. And afterwards he said, no, that wasn't the case. So it's uh, the ticket, ticket scam arrest. Those are corruption. 
Those are not the kind of headlines that you want to be no. associating with your brand, are they? Specifically not on the world platform. I mean, and when you compare all that to the, the semi-finals themselves, you're looking at a 30% margin to the semi-finals. So the focus well and truly shifted off the game itself, in, in my opinion. Um, and then, Eben, we have uh, the two teams that were on the pitch last night, Germany and Brazil. Uh, Brazil press coming in at 73% of the uh, uh, 63% of the time, and that's because, um, you know, people are saying what a poor performance, etc. Yeah. It's not because they were giving accolades. <laughs> <laughs> no, they weren't. Get, they were not getting accolades. They were getting carrots the whole night. Uh, my phone was buzzing the whole night from all this kind of spoof pictures. Yes, you know, lots uh, of comedy. It, there lots was lots of. Comedy. Of course, everyone's a, everyone's a comedian. But let's move on quickly. Just wrap up to, to tonight. Of course, Holland, Argentina, yes. Netherlands. They've never won the World Cup. Yeah, and it <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Argentina may be the... I, I'm not sure if they are the underdogs or not. I'm, I'm not sure. My, my heart is with Argentina. I want them to win tonight, but a lot of people will be upset that I said that. 76% um, of the media are concentrating on, on Argentina's Argentina. performance And tonight. I'm sure a lot of the talk must be around Leo Messi because yes. uh, this is the tournament that Leo Messi has to win if yes. he wants to... If he wants to live up to the, let's call it the ghost of Diego Maradona yes. and other great players, he will never be revered as one of the all-time greats if he doesn't win the if World Cup. If he doesn't win it, yeah, exactly. I think he's under a lot of pressure today. I mean, Messi also coming in on the charts. I had a look this morning, but still nothing compared to Neymar. Neymar being the biggest conversation. So what, what were some of the bigger, other bigger, to bigger, big talking points on social media, Twitter, and, and the like? Well, I mean, isn't it interesting that we've managed to have two of the world's biggest media events in one, in one time frame? So Oscar Pistorius trial, yeah. And, and the World Cup hitting the press at the same time. And if you have a look at the graph on the right, we've got a 50-50 split in the past 24 hours about media reports. So Oscar oh, and okay. World Cup So it's Cup obviously the wrap. Oh, it's Oscar by a short head. By a short head. Yeah, um, look, the Oscar Pistorius press uh, covered um, an awful lot of different angles overnight. The Channel 7 airing of the reenactment video, the closing of arguments and, and the dates being set for that. Um, and then also June Steenkamp for giving Oscar Pistorius yeah. in, in Hello Magazine. So those, those stories created big, big press. And now I expect a lull um, completely on Oscar Pistorius. You'll see on the left-hand side is a timeline yeah. of the two events. So the blue being Oscar and the red being be in the World Cup, and you'll see that the World Cup um, go neck and neck overnight if you have a look towards the right of the screen there. Now, who are now the players that are standing out in the last week or that people are... Who are the guys? Who are the poster boys going into the big, big matches? Well, the big conversation around Müller, obviously, yeah. because of Germany. So him coming through Messi, like you said. Um, it, interesting that Neymar is still so much at the forefront of the yeah. media, even though Brazil have gone home. But he, he really does take the lion's share of the media press. Well, if you had a hairstyle like that, you'd also <laughs> get the lion's share of the media, I suppose. You're right. I do, don't I? <laughs> you do, in a way. I was going to go there, though, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Tonya Curry, director of Roy South Africa, joining us in the studio, giving us unique insight into World Cup 2014. Thanks again. Tonya, we look forward to next week when you come and give us a wrap. No problem. Thank you, Evan. Let's take a quick look now at what you are talking about on social media. I'm sure. I'm sure it's World Cup. So, whatever you want, says Camerol. Brazil, still my favorite international football team. Yeah, that's correct, Camerol. My friends say it's the national team of India, is Brazil. So Maya says, just woke up. Can anyone please tell me what is the final score in last night's match between Brazil and Germany? Uh, you've, uh, you've missed a small, small little 7-1 match there, my dear. I'm sure, I'm sure you were woke up. we were woken up in the middle of the night. Madur Gupta says, the unpresence of Neymar and Thiago Silva down Brazil's morale in semis to lead, lead to 1-7 loss. Well, um, I think you've got to give a little bit of credit to the Germans there. My friend, you know, they uh, just happen to play like a football team. And this is football. In the end, it's a team sport. There we have Leo Messi. Of course, today is all about Leo Messi. Is he as great as everyone says he is? Will he, like Maradona did in 86, go out and single-handedly put his team into a World Cup final and then go on to win it? That is the key question that I think that the world will be asking of Leo Messi today. It's a simple thing. That's the kind of pressure these kinds of players have to deal with every day. It's uh, whether he belongs in the pantheon of greats. Let's take a look at what's happening 
on our Facebook page. Now today, you will see there that uh, our uh, boss, Mr. Klaudi Mutsuneng, has officially been appointed as the SABC's Chief Operations Officer. Chief Executive Officer, I think. You can also read more on what political analysts have to say about the resignation of the Khang SA leader, Mampela Rampela, and then Josie FM DJ Donald Sebolai appearing in court today facing charges of murder. You can find all those stories and more on Newsroom's Facebook page. We keep you up to date all of the time. Let's take a short commercial break. We'll be back with more. I once saw a flower blossom through 27 prison bars of yesterday's unjust flames. I felt an old woman's anticipation for the country's first open elections. And I heard the loud celebrations of that flower's historic inauguration. I was there when unity sang of how the Springbok never held anything back. And we saw a first-time band of 11 men, Shibobo possibility throughout the land. At the foot of Africa, time remembers how truth can reconcile a people. We carved our name into space, and on the world stage, our art stood united. When we blow that vuvuzela, the whole world goes into a trance. And even in that tearful hour of the flower's separation, we are a people who see the music and hear the flowers dance. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. An American-based foundation has donated 15 million rand for the construction of a clinic at Umlazi. This facility that is going to be built here with a 15 million rand contribution from AHF is among other things going to actually help us to expand. Itembale to clinic is the only clinic that caters solely for HIV patients. It accommodates 16,000 people. Your world, weekdays between 11 and 12 midnight. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. The National Union of Metal Workers has announced that it will hold a special National Executive Committee meeting to give feedback on the outcome of its latest negotiations with employers. The union says a new offer was tabled during negotiations yesterday, but was unable to give details of the offer. The committee meeting is expected to take place later today. The National Commissioner of Police, Ria Pieja, has in the meantime said that the strike, which has been characterized by violence and intimidation, is being closely monitored by the police. Political analysts say the re resignation of a Hang SA leader, Dr. Mampela Rampili, is an indication that small opposition parties in South Africa are disappearing in obscurity. Rampili, who launched her party last year, has decided to quit politics after just a year in the political arena. She established a Hang SA amid some fanfare promising to restore the South Africa of Nelson Mandela. The cause of a metro rail train accident that left 80 people injured is being investigated. Two passenger trains collided near Berea and Durban last night, where passengers sustained minor to moderate injuries. One of the trains was on its way from Lazi to Berea station when the accident occurred. The world's youngest nation, South Sudan, celebrates its independence from Sudan today. The festive scenes that capture the historic nature of Juba's long struggle from independence from Khartoum will likely be a distant memory. The country is involved in a seven-month civil war between the government of President Salva Kiir and the rebel breakaway of the SNP Al M under Vice President Rick Pachar. Last night, Brazil's hope of winning their sixth World Cup was shattered by Germany, who scored five goals in 18 astonishing first half minutes on their way to a semi, uh, 7-1 semi-final. 
Germany will now meet Argentina or the Netherlands in Sunday's final in Rio de Janeiro after an unbelievable performance in which striker Miroslav Olse became the tournament's highest scorer of all time with his 16th World Cup goal. Well, that's all from me. Back to you, Yevon. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Anine. Now, recently, murder accused Oscar Pistorius' mental health put the spotlight on the treatment of mental illness here in South Africa. One in three South Africans suffer from mental illness, and up to 75% well, of them do not receive any sort of help. What is even more worrying is that those suffering from depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia don't have access to medical treatment due to the severe shortage of state hospitals specialising in mental illness. Now, to talk to us about the state of the country's mental health, we are joined by Nkini Pasha, a board member of the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Good morning. Thanks for joining Good us. Good morning, Evan. It's alarming that one in three people suffer from mental illness. What does it say about our country and, and how seriously we take the scourge? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's actually quite commendable, this article that was published in the Sunday Times. I think it just really put to the fore the kind of, you know, situation that, um, that, that is, exists in our country. Um, and we believe that the figures that have been given, when you're looking at, you know, a third of our population that suffers from a type of a mental disorder, and we believe that these figures are, in fact, quite, you know, conservative because yeah. there's, a, there's still huge amounts of, you know, communities that are not being included in these statistics. So the problem is really huge. And when, you, when we're reporting, you know, a, a third of um, the population, that includes men, women, kids, even, yeah. you know, so really the problem is actually quite huge. And if one looks at, you know, our country, you know, really South Africa, um, we've come a long way. You know, we are a country that really, you know, deals with a lot of things. We've got historical, you know, baggage that really has impacted negatively, yeah. um, you know, on a lot of our people. And also socioeconomic issues, you know, they, those really, uh, you know, are quite, you know, um, impacting negatively on, on this. I want to change gear a little bit. Mm -hmm. I want to sh shift the focus on, on, on some of the worst crimes that we've seen in this country. Mm -hmm. We see road rage killings, people getting mm -hmm. out of their cars, shooting mm -hmm. other people. Babies raped and murdered. Mm -hmm. A man ate the heart of another man. Mm -hmm. Today is in court today for that. Are these related to mental illness and not treating mentally ill people in South Africa? Can we make that connection? Look, certainly, you know, I mean, I would not sort of put a blanket over, you know, all these scenarios, but we do know from research that, you know, so, you know most of the time there is an underlying, um, you know, psychological or mental um, disorder, you know, and I think, you know, when you look at the kind of, you know, um, the crimes that we experience in South Africa, that we really those are violent crimes, yeah. and that leaves a lot of, you know, our people experiencing what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Now, that is a type of an anxiety disorder obviously impacting you know um, um, you know people individual I mean psychologically and emotionally but also you know when we look at men in particular you know the way we handle and and try and cope with a mental disorder is quite different from how women would actually present yeah. so very often men would be more aggressive and yes. um, you know they would act out and also you know unfortunately when that situation is not managed and treated that can actually lead to a severe consequence being suicide. But we know that then men don't only kill themselves, yeah. but they also wipe out their families. Yes. So sometimes when we see or this road... Or they shoot someone on the road. Absolutely. Or... When we see this road rage, yeah. you know, it could potentially be you know, an, an aggression you know, from an, you know, an underlying mental yeah. disorder that actually manifests in that manner. How do you then, as an ordinary member of society, how do you keep this, these kind of statistics at mind mm -hmm. and then still engage? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, as a South African Depression and Anxiety Group, you know, we are really trying to increase the awareness and really educate, you know, our society at large. And of course, you know, media platforms such as these ones play a significant role in ensuring that more and more people can be aware of the signs and symptoms to look out for. And when they do recognize those signs, what steps do they need to take to ensure that either themselves they can get help or their family member or you know friend loved one that they can actually you know channel them and direct them in the right way um, to be able to get assisted you know I need to stress as well that with mental disorders um, there is you know there is help 
you know, most of these mental, um, health, mental disorders are actually treatable, they are actually manageable, and once people are, you know, being able to receive the treatment, yeah. they can actually lead very fruitful, um, you know, um, lives. Productive lives. Well, that's the, that's the good news. I'm going to have to bring you back at some point, Kini, mm -hmm. because this is a wider discussion that Indeed. we need to have as a nation, and I also want to take it onto social media a little bit. So, thank you for joining us today. We've pleasure. run out of time. We've got to cross over to Anine, who's standing by with Ned Bank, who've been running this fantastic campaign for the last couple of months. Thanks, Anine. That's right, Eben. The finale of Netbank's month-long winter campaign took place in Grahamstown last week, where artists from Johannesburg's Living Artist Emporium unveiled 10 paintings they've made to help raise more funds for new blankets for the vulnerable children, orphans and the elderly across South Africa. This year, Netbank also contributed 200,000 rand to build on its five-year-long association with the Ray Machlana Skills Training Centre in Port Elizabeth, where students get the opportunity to contribute to the growth of the economy. To talk to us about this exciting project, we are now joined by Netbank Senior G Marketing Manager, Maceda Ratsikuni, and by LAE artist Simpiwe Mlangeni. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Nice to have us. Maceda, if I can just start with you. This has been a campaign that's been running for the past five years. What were the highlights for you this year? Look, I think, I mean, we obviously put a, I think, a, a very interesting campaign. Of course, the, you know, the, the big uh, ice spade that we had at, you know, at uh, the beginning of the campaign, the stuff that we had at, uh, at, at Grahamstown, that's really exciting stuff. But I think for our team on the ground, what we found is as we gave the blankets to, to people, that's been the most touching thing because mm. you, you see people that have, you know, have a real need and you actually make a difference. And I think that's ultimately, I think, the stuff that you know, gets your heart warm and saying, you know what, we're doing a good thing. You're right. And like I've mentioned, it wasn't just the blankets. So um, how much was donated this year? Look, if, if everything goes well, of course, we, we're not 100% uh, finished. The art that we're actually currently auctioning and, and people can actually go and see it on our, uh, you know, f f uh, the NetBank Facebook page. If everything goes well, we should get 100,000 plus. Of course, as NetBank, we've already put in 500,000 as part of this uh, campaign. And uh, in total, I think over the f last five years, we spent about 3.2 million in actually giving uh, uh, you know, blankets, about 16,500 of those, uh, touching about 36,000 people thus far. And then just as NetBank, how do you decide who benefits from a project like this? Look, as you know, we have people, we're a national organization, we have people on the ground in the communities and one of the things that we want to do is make sure that our staff and are actually involved in communities. So a lot of them, uh, you know, no organization. So for example, some of the people that received uh, the blankets in Grahamstown was the Grahamstown Hospice, was the Jabez, you know, Health Aid Center, schools, creches. So, so our staff know the, you know, the organization on the ground and we have a long-term relationship with them. So that's how we kind of choose and make sure that, um, you know, the blankets that we give and the work that we do actually makes a difference. So as an example, we don't give street children because we don't really know what's going to obviously happen with that. We want to give to formal organizations um, that we can actually make sure that the blanket is there and is actually used, I think, over a long period of time as well. All right. Ms. I haven't forgotten about yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, you were one of the artists this year involved in um, making some of the paintings. What was your experience like? Well, uh, my experience was, was very fantastic in a way, like, because uh, NetBank had, had this campaign uh, going on, and they had Living Artist Emporium to, to basically have us to do the artworks for, for the campaign. And, uh, I mean, it was the best thing that could happen. And, uh, I mean, uh, from, from the work that I do, Simpio Mlangeni, uh, uh, it was aligned with what I do as an artist in terms of out on, on the campaign. So, basically, uh, it was a very great experience to be part of it. What did you enjoy the most? Well, uh, what I enjoyed the most, it was the, the, the creative part of it while creating the artworks for, for, for the campaign and uh, basically and, uh, and basically having uh, all the artists from, from Living Artist Emporium to be part of it and, uh, and raising a voice using our, our art. Okay, and then just quickly tell us a bit about the two paintings you made and what you thought about the other paintings. Uh, the two paintings that I've made, um, I call them Winter 1 and uh, Winter 2. 
basically uh, I use uh, in those paintings I used like colors uh, yeah, like blue and yellow to basically talk about the color of winter so basically the blue uh, talks about how winter begins and the yellow and it talks about how winter becomes more warmer so uh, and I use nature basically to to, to portray my all right so then you who's not from Netbank what change do you think this is making in people's lives well I mean uh, it, it, it makes a difference to 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 people who, who basically need the help I mean uh, it's something that I mean society should do to basically help people to to basically involve uh, evolve their lifestyle to to basically to a better good yeah great Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Evan, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Anine. We all want winter to be a little bit warmer, a little bit better. It's cold out there. Minus two this morning when I left home wasn't exactly the, well, the thing I wanted to do. I wanted to stay home and be with the family, and I suppose that's what every human being on this planet wants. That's where we leave it today. Try and make winter warmer for everybody. Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park in Johannesburg, South Africa. Every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. We also stream live on YouTube at that time with a whole show available on our YouTube channel all of the time. So no excuses. You can watch it in the office. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We just love it in the morning.